Welcome to the planet. Well, welcome to this lap around the sun. Uh, my name is Gary Studi. I am a horticulturist. I'm a plant physiologist. I am a space biologist. I am. Uh, I originally was on a, a faculty at the University of Maryland teaching horticulture, apples, peaches, plums, and pears. Then the opportunity came to go to Kennedy Space Center to, to evaluate the possibility of growing plants in space and keeping people alive on Earth. So today, I want to talk to you about how growing plants in space will enable us to grow these plants on Earth to, to feed us. They are, I have had the privilege of working for nearly 20, uh, over 20 years with some of the brightest people on the planet at Kennedy Space Center, finding ways to launch things to, to the rocket. And now, what I decided about seven years ago was to step away from that and found a company called Synergy so I can talk about how we can apply that technology here on Earth. I want to share a little bit about that with you today. So where am I? Where is, is Synergy? Where are we located? I am at the west coast, east, east coast of Florida. That's at the gates of Kennedy Space Center. You'll see that yellow line is, is the actual gate. We are surrounded by a booming industry of commercialization of space. It is no longer the purview of of the superpowers of the United States, of Russia, or China. But commercial companies are allowing that democratization and access to space. Blue Origin, before I left here two days ago, I felt the power of the launch of the heaviest rocket on the planet pulse through me 12 kilometers from my laboratory. I will return in two weeks and hear a rocket that is capable of getting us to Mars. So I am located at an area of innovation of engineers for space. My job, my little job, is to apply that technology to keep us alive down here on Earth. Two major events are going to occur in the next 30 years. One, we will go to Mars. And when we go to Mars, that will redefine us as a species. This will be a seminal point of our evolution. It will define and describe for generations our potential to turn dreams into a reality. But at the same time, three billion people are going to come to the planet. This challenge to feed and sustain a healthy planet will challenge us to redefine who we are, how we envision ourselves on this earth, how we protect it, and how we care for those around us. To look at either one, the problem or the vision, without bringing them together, I feel does a disservice to both. We must look to the stars, but look at the challenges and apply those to, to, to Earth. We are going to go to Mars. I know it's hard to believe, but it is an inhospitable place. You step outside, you will die. There is very little atmosphere. It is very cold. It is very hot. The nutrients are not available in the soil, but we are going. 14 satellites have been sent to Mars. Seven of them are actively mapping, searching, finding out locations to land. There have been six robots on the surface of, of Mars. For over a quarter of a century, somebody's job has been to drive a remote-controlled vehicle on the surface of Mars. Think about that. We are going. 
We are drilling, we are mining, we are doing our due diligence. We are preparing to go. What do we need when we get there? Well, I want to stay alive. And there are four things that we need. One, breathe fresh air. Without oxygen, we will slowly, we close this all up, we will talk, we'll get sleepy and we will fade. We will suffocate. If we don't clean up that atmosphere, we will suffocate from too much CO2. We need fresh water. Otherwise, we can talk a little longer till we get dehydrated, we say, and we don't wake up. And finally, there is food. So what do we need? We read more or less a, you know, a, a kilogram, a little less, 800 grams of oxygen every day coming in. We need about 600, 700 grams dry weight of food per day. We need five times that in terms of water just to stay alive. And then the water is essential for the prepping the food, for the, our sanitation, and our security to keep us healthy and safe. So if you do that arithmetic for, one, for a crew of four people for one year, that is approx over 40 metric tons of resources necessary just to stay alive. But we're in a closed system. We can't just dump it in the sea. We've got to keep resourcing. That means for every breath in of fresh oxygen, there is a breath out of toxic CO2 that will asphyxiate us if we let that accomplish. If we take then this glass of water, it comes out not so fresh water, but we're gonna be drinking this glass of water for the next three years. We take in healthy food and it comes out not so healthy. We have 40 tons in, 40 tons out. How do you achieve a sustainable maintaining system on the surface of a planet? That's where we began to look at biological life support systems. We take plants who have the capability with light to take or waste CO2 and regenerate fresh oxygen. Through transpiration of the soil, can extract the waste nutrients and contaminated water and produce fresh water. And if we do the dials correctly, we produce food. So biological life support. I began working on that in the 19, early 1990s with the objective of demonstrating the feasibility of keeping one person alive for one year using biological life support. And the facility that we used was a large chamber that had been a vacuum chamber for the Mercury and Gemini programs. We sealed it up. We put in four, uh, 96, 400 watt high pressure sodium lights. We closed the atmosphere. We recycled the water. We condensed it and began to grow plants. Over the course of the time, we had four levels, I think is probably one of the first examples of vertical farms here on the planet, not by a design, but that was a necessity because this was the resource, a waste, a, 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 a discarded part of a rocket that we would convert. We were utilizing the resources that were available that we would have to adapt for a moon or Mars. And we began to grow plants. So over the next decade, it was a very, very productive program. Over 600 scientific journal articles came out of that. I won't share all of those with you or any of those details, but some things I am very proud of that I think have application here and have altered the way we grow food here on the planet. First, we began to look at the limits of productivity. When you go into a controlled environment, you control the water, you control the nutrients, the carbon dioxide, 
the light, give the plant what it needs, we were able to uncover the productivity potential that we, I think had too far been unacknowledged. Potatoes, we grew at twice world record field yields in two thirds of the time. At the date, four times the world record yield of wheat anywhere on the planet. The lettuce limits were 20% higher than the models that were coming out of Cornell University. The models that are used by many people worldwide are adapted from the data and the production limits that we set on that time. We evaluated numerous sensors, automation, control technology, varieties, but ultimately by pushing the horticulture, by pushing the possibility of the genetics, we redefined what was possible. And through that possibilities, we, we ended up at one point at over a year, 418 days of continuous production of recycling the atmosphere, recycling the water, processing the inedible bio way, biomass, returning that to the plants. At the end of that program, I had the opportunity to say, we've done this on Earth, can we do it in space? So I was the lead on an experiment that went to the International Space Station, we called PESTO, where we were growing wheat, where we were recycling the water, recycling the CO2, we were growing on different cartridges. We had to develop techniques to recover water, get it to the root system where water floats, soil floats, particle floats. You have changes in convective environments, a very difficult and strange environment where to grow plants. Yet over that time, I think we demonstrated over seven cycles of taking seeds out and placing them in that we could grow plants on the International Space Station as well as we could on Earth. We could reproduce the water, we could get this atmosphere, we could keep people alive. To me, I went from a big chamber to a small chamber and said, let's go to Mars. But to do that, we needed new technologies. The lighting technologies are not that exist were not suitable. They would grow plants, but they are high pressure sodium lamps. They're hot. They will burn you. There are safety problems. They break. Nobody likes floating glass coming in their ears or their eyes or up their nose. It is, they're replaceable. You've got a three-year mission of disposables and, and re consumables. You don't want to pack them if you can help it. So you needed reliability, safety, and controllability. That began a journey into the study of solid-state lighting, light-emitting diodes, LEDs. And those techniques have enabled us to go from far away from the plants to growing them close to the plants. We can control and optimize the energy to the lights. But in that process, what did we learn? We learned that we could transform the way we grew plants in much the same way by altering the, the quality of CO2, water, and nutrients. We could produce a different plant now we can change the biochemistry by light. This is an exciting time to be a plant biologist. The tools have to for bringing forth possibilities we did not exist. By simply changing the amount of blue light at the right time during that production of a green lettuce, we were able to induce the the bioprotective compounds, the anthocyanins, the carotenoids, the antioxidants that provide health, that provide the bioprotectants, increase the nutrient concentrations by 75%. No new germplasm, no GMOs, no extra energy, just playing with the dials. We can alter the biology to increase the profitability, the nutrition, and the profitability 
of those crops. By all measures, we have been successful on that. For the past five years, astronauts on the International Space Station have been growing their own food. It is in a small chamber. It is lettuce. They're growing tomatoes. They've grown peppers, bok choy, a range of vegetables, not so much for the people fuel, but for the calories, but for those that are there to protect and maintain our health. As has been told earlier, that when we are in space, we are bombarded by a, uh, a series of, of events in a strange environment. We have radiation damage. We have uh, all kinds of things. And it is the fruits and vegetables, the colors you see behind us, that are protecting us and maintaining that health. So that is what we focus on. So in this section, that, that period of 10 to 15 years has established the research that has enabled the possibility of new ways of growing food here on this planet. It is arguable that it has enabled the rise of the indoor agriculture industry for vertical farming because now you've got the controls and those possibilities and those investments. I like to think that we played some small part in this change of those lights, which are now being mandated all across Europe for greenhouses and that transformation. What am I currently doing in our lab? I am continuing to try and use the space to create opportunities for biological solutions to problems here on Earth. The synergy experiments comes from the symbiosis of plants and microbes in the root system. How do you develop these possibilities that we try and ignore because we can't see them? But where do you have these beneficial relationships? So over a series of three flight experiments, one on the last spatial experiment, STS-135, I felt honored to be on that final mission, and two subsequent as a as as a, as a private entity on a private rocket to a private laboratories, looking at these interactions. And we grew these small payloads with plants and microbes, brought them back, tried to see what change it had incurred on that environment. And so our goal was once we removed those bacteria, we began to culture them, try and identify them, and then apply them to hydroponic systems. We selected populations that were beneficial on increasing seed germination. We propagate those. We look those in other concentrations, and you're seeing dramatic effects from on basil and lettuce. And these are not under stress conditions. My controls are standard hydroponic solutions. These are beneficials that are increasing and accentuating that biological possibilities. Our goal is to find solutions that make the better the best, to take good to better. Some technological, some a genetic, but biological, sustainable systems that can be maintained there on the planet, but clearly have applications here on Earth. So that cycle is through that discovery Use microgravity, using space to discover what is possible to get the challenges for that very unique environment. Bring that down to, to the ground, find what works and, and translates, what's stable, what doesn't change. Scale it up as some pilot project, prove that it is useful, and then move that out and deploy at scale because we have a necessities for doing that. But the, we have biological problems, we have light problems, but we have supply problems. As has been mentioned earlier, it takes a lot of fertilizer to grow plants. And a lot of that fertilizer is wasted. I look around this greenhouse and I, I am impressed with the productivity. It, it gives me joy, it gives me happiness. 
I also see that half of the energy, half of the labor, half of the water, half of the nutrients are going into leaves and stems that are going to be composted or dumped. They are wasted resource. We are putting energy out of a system and going forward. So what we find as doing a lot of calculations from our work in, at Space Center, that it takes about you know, 50% more than your body weight of fertilizer to feed you each year. That are, those are nutrients taken out of the soil, taken out of the system, and dumped somewhere else. We need to recover those. There are means of doing that relatively easily through just some, some leaching to get easy ones. Microbially, we can get more of that. So it is relatively straightforward using biological means to get over half those nutrients back from this leaves and stems to feed back into the system to achieve a sustainable, maintainable system. This was demonstrated in our test at Kennedy Space Center for 418 days. Using biological treatments, we need to use those again. But not only do, how do you, you do that from the things you know, but there are also resources that we think we cannot access. Some of that was talked about earlier today. And uh, there have been collaborations with the University of North Dakota in, in these habitats, trying to find out how you would live and work together in a closed system on, on the moon or Mars. And that one, it's, it gets very cold there. Last time I was there, it was negative 30 C. It was cold. <laughs> it also gets very hot. And that is, it makes it a very beautiful place to work. Because if you start looking at some of the challenges we're going to have when we go to Mars, and we will go to Mars, is there is what they call the regolith. There's no organic matter in it. There's a lot of nutrients, but they're not accessible. They're bound up. On part of that, there are materials that will kill the plants, but they are rich in nutrients. So how do you access those? Our thoughts on this particular test, we can take our waste material from our inedible food and biomass, our leaves and stems. We mix it with this inedible and toxic waste there that would be from the soil, and we feed it to worms. And those worms can take that biological waste and they weather, they start breaking down and weathering that soil, a biological weathering for releasing. And it takes this waste, releases the nitrogen and conduces that. It takes this toxic material and turns it into soil. What were our first results? Well, they were really promising to me. Because if we could grow on the regolith, we could add water and they would germinate, but they would not grow. They would die. We cannot grow things on the surface of Mars. If when we go, if we step outside, we will die. We bring the soil in and we try growing in it, it will die. Yet when we bring in the biological system, we bring in our waste, we combine those together, we were able to create things to grow up to 25% of with that regolith. Are we there yet? No. Are there problems? Yes. Are there lots of issues? Yes. Are there lots of possibility? Definitely. We were 75% to a commercial mix on our first shot out. We have a potential for achieving biological solutions for biological problems of food. We are going to go to Mars in the next decades. We are going to do it in style. We are going to do it in some purpose. We are going to do it with a, a, a mission. We are going to have new ways of doing it. It will likely be commercial, and we will go so we can change the way that we do. We exist as a species. But all is not well here on this planet. It is the climate is changing. The weather is getting more extreme. I've experienced in the west coast uh, of, of, of the U.S. I just had a hurricane pass across my house that went from nothing to something very quickly. There are fires across the planet. It is a changing environment that is altering the productivity 
and the predictions that we can have that will only get worse. And they are not all that predictable, and we're going to have to learn to adapt. And this challenge of changing an environment with less resources is coming in the face of 3 billion people coming to the planet. That's a big number. I don't know what it means. So I had to look it up. And what that means is the entire population of Europe. It is the entire plus the population of North America, plus South America, plus Australia, plus Japan, plus a little bit sliver of North Africa. And they are all coming to dinner. And we are setting the place now to feed them. They are coming in some of the poorest areas in the world, some of the least areas to maintain those populations. And that is going to define us as a species as how we address that issue. If you look at the map, that population is at your doorstep. So what we are looking is how do we solve and maintain that? We have these challenges of the political disruptions and the pandemic brought to the fore issues we had tried to ignore. But these are these split images that I took within a few kilometers of my home at the beginning of the pandemic, where I, there were empty shelves, but the inability to get the food to market. So we were dropping that. Food lines that I had never seen before. So you had excesses of food, excesses of demand. The system broke. But the beautiful thing is, it only took a few months for it to recover. And it had been mentioned earlier, there was no widespread starvation. There was no great famine. The system had adjusted because of various resiliencies and the opportunities to adapt and react from agriculture and this entire system. To meet those challenges of the three billion and to maintain that with less resources is we're going to require sustainable systems and the conventional agriculture will not work. It cannot meet the challenge that is in front of us, which is why I am absolutely delighted to be here. Because from the past one greenhouse less than a lifetime ago, it has grown to the greatest concentration of greenhouses here on the planet. Solar greenhouses, controlled environment agriculture, indoor protected agriculture by whatever name, it has taken a place that was one of the poorest in Europe that is lacking water, but took the resources that were available, an abundant amount of sunlight, water from the soil, and use that as effectively and efficiently as possible. Are there problems? Yes. Are they being met? Maybe yes, maybe no. I say yes, you've gone from one to the largest concentration on the planet. It is a success story that you need to be proud of because where I look, I see sensors, I see automated control, I see matching demand to what the plant needs. I see optimization of resources that are available. Those chain challenges that come from living on Mars, going to a different planet, that we must use what we have in the most efficient and effective means possible. The possibilities that existed today did not exist in terms of controls, in terms of, of, of systems. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. We live on an extremely fragile planet. We live, we are protected by a very thin atmosphere. We are under amazing challenges, but it is our home. This is where we live. And that, that small corner where we are standing there at that area is now feeding Europe. 60, 70% of whatever produce with immeasurable 
consequences in terms of health and well-being of a population. You're not supplying the calories, although you're supplying some, but what you are really supplying is the health and well-being of a population. That challenge must be met for five times that population of Europe in half the time that you have developed this industry here. There is much work to be done. There is much work to be able to improve the efficiency of water use, nutrient use, nutrient recovery, but it is achievable. And a reason I have faith that it is achievable because in a lifetime of what you have achieved here. And it is imperative that we do it, not just for the profitability, not just because I like doing it, not because it is fun, but because it's for them. They are the ones that are going to have to solve the problems. We have set the stage. We are providing the tools. It is imperative upon us to set, give them the vision and imagination that comes from going to Mars, from meeting the challenges that are achieving the impossible, to achieve the very difficult that is going to be on Earth. We must both look to the stars, we must look down to the earth to apply those challenges here, and then together, let us all work together and feed the planet. Thank you very much.